froze and, and knowing to add your egg slowly so that you don't break the emulsion uh, is a big part of that. So just, um, I wish you could see the, the mixer thing here, but really you're just, you're adding your one egg, allowing it to incorporate and then and then uh, you'll be you'll be scraping down as soon as that that egg has started to incorporate. Just scrape the bowl down and ensure that it's all fully mixed in. Then add your other without mixing the the mix too much between them. So you you don't want to. This is not the point where you want to you know walk away and forget about the mix at this point. Uh, while you're clean, creaming the butter, there's a little bit more forgiveness in that in that segment. Again, you can cream the butter two minutes and you can cream the butter five minutes, and it will produce different results, but they'll all be delicious. We have two different KitchenAid paddles for different sizes and we're always confusing them. So that's why we're struggling. <laughs> I have the magic touch. Still got it. All right. Is it this one? Yes. So this is what our one egg looks like. So everything has been mixed in thoroughly. Looks a little fluffier. And then we'll continue with. I should add that this process is significantly easier if all of your ingredients are at room temperature. Uh, and you shouldn't be afraid to leave the eggs, butter, and sugar out for quite some time. In my experience, it takes you know, a day or so at room temp to start to kind of lose some of the freshness. So uh, don't be afraid to, to leave the ingredients on your counter for a few hours or more. Um, you know, if you, if you intend to bake at night, you can pull them out in the morning, as long as they're not somewhere very warm or anything like that. Or where your dog will eat all of the butter. <laughs> or where your dog oh, will I'm eat all the butter. <laughs> So while, while I have my egg incorporating um, for the last addition, I'm going to toss together all of my dry ingredients so that everything is um, well mixed together so that we don't have any patches of baking soda in some cookies and not in others. So it's always good to mix all of your dry ingredients together in a bowl and make sure everything is fully incorporated before you add the dry into a mix. So I'm just tossing them together until it looks like one uniform color. This is actually uh, probably one of the reasons why a lot of recipes tell you to sift your flour um, is actually just to distribute the dry ingredients because it can be really problematic if there's a big pocket of uh, baking soda or baking powder or yeast, uh, an ingredient that has a really big impact for its mass stuck to the side of your bowl or something like that. So um, sifting together the dry ingredients, uh, that, is, that is frequently the true reason why it's done, especially in a recipe that uses grams um, and not volumetric, uh, volumetric measures. Otherwise, the old recipes that use volumetric measure, measures, they tell you to sift the flour uh, so that it becomes, attains kind of a uniform fluffiness and so you can kind of measure it accurately um, because again, flour, uh, one of the reasons we do all of our, uh, and, and really any professional baker, do all of their um, <clears throat> baking in, in grams and units of, of mass uh, it are because you can't get a uniform measure out of a cup of flour. It depends entirely on how, um, how heavily you pack the flour, uh, how fluffy the flour was initially, how much moisture is trapped in it, et cetera. So um, always best to use uh, a scale if, if you can to make baking easy for yourself. So this is what I'm 
explains what the mixer looks like after all of the eggs are separated. And now when I add my drives in, I always go um, in increments of three. So I'll add a third at a time, mix it, scrape, another third, mix it, scrape, just so that I am sure that everything is getting separated evenly. And I'm not um, having any clumps anywhere. We'll do a third, we'll mix it. And we'll do the chocolate chips last. So once most of our dry ingredients are incorporated, just before everything is hydrated, we'll throw in the chocolate chips so that we don't overmix the dough. And then we'll have cookie dough. We're almost there. I should add that one of the actual benefits of using a whole grain flour here, specifically spelt, which does not have uh, too much capacity for maximal strength, uh, is that it's actually harder to to overmix them in the standard formula. So all-purpose flour, uh, as much as we like to think of spelt as a good all-purpose flour, all-purpose flour is, is a bit of a, a misnomer because it really isn't designed optimally for any particular application. And most all-purpose flours actually have a really, really strong maximum capacity. So that means if you mix them a lot or if you continue to develop gluten, they become very strong, which is why so many of the recipes that you're used to uh, that have um, <clears throat> that have measures for uh, that use all-purpose flour, they instruct you to very, very carefully combine the the dries uh, and, and mix to, to just incorporate, even maybe leaving some flour loss. Um, and that's probably because the flour is best suited for a um, an application where it requires a little bit more strength. And if you continue to, to mix uh, your, 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 let's say your uh, muffin batter, you will develop more strength and uh, end up with a, um, end up with a uh, batter that has developed uh, so much strength that it's tough. Now, uh, the whole grain flours have two things working against that happening. One is they have all of these um, particles of bran, which are, again, are flavorful and nutritious, uh, but they also have, um, a, a tendency to cut gluten as it develops, which means um, you can prevent against that maximum strength from developing. Uh, the other side of it is that spelt has a lower maximal strength capacity than a lot of uh, a lot of flours. So, um, in, in my experience, at least, uh, it's it's much more difficult to overmix. Um, Sometimes that leads to, to really useful shortcuts in a professional application, which is to say that for some of our uh, batters that we use at the cafe, um, I'm actually able to mix those with, with a stick blender uh, just for a given amount of time, which would be unthinkable for, for a delicate batter uh, with all purpose flour because you just make something that's too tough. All right, so I have most of my drives incorporated and I am going to um, turn the mixer on low and add my chocolate chips while I connect it. I usually fold the chocolate chips in by hand a little bit. Um, you don't have to like mix crap out of it. Am I allowed to say that? Definitely. Um, <laughs> So I like getting I my hands so. in things. I like knowing how things are supposed to feel. So I prefer to, when I can, big batches, obviously you can't do this as well, but with home cooking, I always like to use my hands as much as possible so that I know how things are supposed to feel. So I'm getting all the batter off my paddle. I don't know if you guys realize this, but this is a, uh, professional baker's permission and, and allowance to get as messy and have as much fun as you possibly can in the process. Okay, so I like to scoop my cookie dough right away so that it's easiest on my hands. Um, and then I will always refrigerate it overnight. I know that that's very hard to make cookie dough and then <laughs> refrigerated and not eat any of it. Um, I'm a big cookie dough eating person, so I understand. <laughs> um, I don't think anyone, besides Lindsay maybe, who's another um, 
coworker of ours. Um, she eats a lot of cookie dough as well. <laughs> um, but I think she's the only one that has me beat that I've ever met. I, I feel like I have the biggest sweet tooth out of most people that are in this industry, I feel like. So I guess we'll put this in a bowl so that we can scoop it together. You can see what it looks like. Um, so we're going to bake some of these fresh cookies just so you can see the difference between a cookie dough that has been mixed a couple days ago versus a cookie dough that was mixed fresh. They're going to bake differently. They're going to have a little bit different of a texture because the flour has been it has more time to absorb all of the ingredients when you rest it. So that's a big reason why most bakeries make their cookie dough in advance and um, either freeze it or keep it in the fridge for at least a day, um, up to in the freezer up to two months, honestly. Um, freezing raw like dough works really well. Keeps things fresh versus If this is too much for you to make, we, we highly recommend, you may want to bake, of course, I'm sure you want to bake them tonight and you totally should and they'll be delicious, uh, but uh, you can refrigerate them. And then as like I said, they, they will continue to improve in the freezer for, for a while, so. I always have cookie dough in my freezer at home, always. That's a nice thing to take home. You're like, oh, I feel like one cookie tonight or two cookies. <laughs> you can know, have cookies every night if you want. <laughs> and for breakfast, we've noticed. Yeah, right. I eat a lot of cookies for breakfast. Well, our day, our um, pastry day starts at 3 a.m. every day to get deliveries out, to um, get things ready for the next day. So we This lifestyle would only be possible with whole grain, delicious, <laughs> nutritious cookies. Otherwise, it would be a very short, uh, short career, probably. Uh, I should add that um, I uh, recommend you go to our website to, to uh, look at our grains, our wonderful grain zines. Um, again, they're they're all posted free on the website as a resource for whole grain recipes. Uh, but also um, one of the, the people that we admire greatly and um, uh, draw a lot of inspiration from is the Washington State University Bread Lab and all the people who work there who have also been contributors to those scenes. Uh, they're really doing um, amazing grain breeding academic work to, to forward the, the grain movement. Um, and they have, uh, they have a lot of resources at their disposal as well, so check that out. I'll talk more a little bit more about them later once once uh, we've worked, worked, gotten the cookies in the oven. So I have as many as we're gonna bake here. So I'm gonna throw these in the oven. They'll take about 12 to 13 minutes to bake for this size. The ones that we sell at farmers markets and in the cafe are definitely bigger than this uh, like home size. But um, I would say at least like a 12 minute bake would be good. Depends on how chewy or crispy you want your cookies. Anywhere from 12 to 15 or 16 minutes, I think would be a good window. Um, yeah, you want to throw these in? This is an unbuttered parchment. There is enough butter in the cookies. Uh, not that there's any more than a standard chocolate chip cookie recipe. In fact, this was uh, loosely based off of kind of a Toll House cookie uh, originally. So um, it's not any anything extreme. Uh, but there's enough butter in the recipe that you do not need to butter your parchment uh, and the cookies. Uh, having a, a parchment that is not buttered will actually help with the structure of the cookies a little bit because it'll give them something to loosely grab as they bake. Um, I mentioned the, the Washington State Bread Lab because uh, this whole experience reminded me of a very interesting project they have going that was unfortunately, the grant funding was canceled by the Trump administration. Uh, but there's actually an ongoing project to figure out how to um, get whole grain uh, consumption up in um, children in developing countries. And the solution of course is, is to put them in, in cookies. So um, 
while that, you know, multi million or I don't know how, how much the funding was, but while that was unfortunately canceled, uh, we like to think that we're uh, carrying on the spirit of that and the, the practical arm of that. Um, all of the cookies that we make are whole grain, and we'll, we'll walk through some of the uh, other whole grain examples while the cookies are in the oven. So um, here we have, huh? oh, we'll do the bread too. Yeah. Uh, here we have a, a plethora of, of uh, treats, and uh, this is just kind of a, um, a good uh, showcase for the diversity of some of the grains, but also uh, just, just to give you an idea of what you can make at home. Um, something that is kind of, I think, new to all of us and uh, that we've been really playing a lot with is um, using rye in pastry. So rye bread is notoriously hard to, to make, but, um, <clears throat> and, and that there's uh, really good reasons for that, which is that it's not really well suited to uh, some of the processes of, of commercial, uh, recent commercial industrial baking, which all rely on, um, uh, commercial yeast and things like that. So rye really likes a good slug of acidity at the beginning, whenever you're mixing a dough to work properly. Um, there's all sorts of fascinating microscopic uh, reasons for that, that that have to do with, with uh, different classes of enzymes in rye flour. Uh, I'm glad to go into that if you have any questions about it. But um, those same reasons that make rye so difficult to, uh, or not difficult actually, uh, that make rye different to make bread with than wheat um, don't seem to hold true in a lot of pastry applications for a variety of reasons. One being that um, typically the products are thinner, um, so heat penetrates through to the core of the product much quicker than in a, in a, uh, a very tall bread, for example. So um, without going into too much more detail about rye, uh, it makes really wonderful pastries. Um, it has uh, about double the fiber of uh, whole wheat applications. So rye is even better for you uh, than, than wheat. Um, it's got a much lower glycemic index and it is also incredibly tasty. It's super earthy flavor that um, when fermented has, takes on kind of a really nice tangy green apple quality. So really, really love rye. Uh, but uh, Lex will, will maybe speak a little bit more about it, but we found that it's totally suitable for a lot of pastry applications. Also makes really good pancakes and batters and things like that. And typically does not require dramatic alteration of the, the traditional ratio of a recipe to use for that application. Yeah, I mean, we have, we don't have as many uh, pastries on the line with dry flour, you can use flour for that. I do like using rye flour and some dark recipes like chocolate. Um, we have a good sourdough um, rye brownie where we take leftover um, rye starter from the bakery that um, is too acidic for bread and we mix that into brownies and it has a really nice tangy fudgy texture that kind of brings to that. Um, my favorite flour to work with in general is spelt. So it was a good um, you know intro to the cookie dough and good intro to spelt. But it also makes a great um, pie crust. I use um, like a base pie crust, and can I hold it? Yeah. I use a base pie crust um, of 100% spelt flour um, that we make galettes out of. You can make. Um, we also use the same dough for our knishes, our smoked salt knishes. These, by the way, are amazing. <laughs> and Lex may may not to uh, their horn uh, loudly enough because I think they're her, her babies. And her they pets. are my babies. <laughs> and she's very humble and modest, but uh, if you come by our cafe, you should definitely get these because they're one of the most delicious, they're one of the most delicious things that I've eaten in the past few years. So definitely get a knish. Um, another secret weapon in the knish is the smoked malt flour, which is the same smoked malt flour that is in the cookie dough. So when you take a bite of that cookie, it's going to be kind of hard to imagine it in a savory tone, but um, it does wonders with potatoes in this knish filling as well. Um, but spelt flour, it's like tender flakiness, blends really well to pie dough. It um, is a really good cake flour as well. So I have like a mother cake recipe that I 
have dialed in in the past few years and I use all spelt flour for that just because I love the texture that it imparts. I love the color and the flavor. Um, it's pretty amazing how when you start to bake with whole grains, this whole new world opens up of, oh my gosh, I didn't know that like a cake could taste like something. It's just like vanilla white cake. But when you use a whole grain flour, um, it adds a lot more depth of flavor than you thought that it ever could. So it's really amazing to be able to learn how to bake with whole grain flours and, um, you know, understand like how beautiful they can be as well. Can you guys hear me? Um, this was great. Um, I hope everybody did not make a mess in their kitchens like I did, but I have my batter. I didn't so one quick thing, like when you scoop it, did you roll in your hands or you just place it on the parchment? Whatever, whatever I love you. I use the cookie scoop, but if you want to roll it, if you want like perfect circular cookies, you can roll it in your hand. If you're not, it's, not, it's also not that deep, so you can totally like spoon it on your, um, your parchment paper and you can go. Yeah, if, if you have a little uh, uh, container of warm water, you can dip your spoon in the kitchen if you'd like, uh, but it's also not necessary. It's just to make it slightly easier. So I just wanted to apologize to everyone because the sound was a little tricky. I think when you guys speak directly on the mic, like holding the mic, it's a lot easier to hear. Okay. So I just want to get to some of the questions. Um, there is, uh, so the first one, uh, someone asked if there's no vanilla extract in this recipe. There isn't. You can you can, you can definitely add vanilla extract. I'm not against that. We just feel like it's not always necessary to add that flavor. When you have so much flavor from the spelt flour and the smoked barley, um, the malt, um, that we don't feel like it's necessary. But you can definitely add a teaspoon, a teaspoon and a half of vanilla if you'd like. Another question, what exactly is smoked malt? And maybe that's a good a little bit about malt and how it's used. Yeah, so uh, I'll be speaking. I'll speak on uh, Mark uh, Brault's uh, behalf from from Deer Creek Malt House, who's a, a dear friend of ours. Uh, and you'll be seeing more of him in the Movers and Makers segment tomorrow. Uh, but malt is essentially sprouted grain that's been carefully dried um, and dehydrated to stop the sprouting process uh, and also lightly toast the grain lightly. Um, but to retain all of the properties that make it actually alive. So uh, when malt is rehydrated, um, it becomes alive again. It, it won't continue to sprout because um, you interrupted that cascade, uh, but it will reactivate the biological properties, the, the enzymes in the malt that were causing that sprouting turn on again, and they start to break down uh, proteins and, and uh, uh, carbohydrates into their smaller building blocks. Uh, of uh, amino acids and sugars, and those create a, a lot, a lot of flavor. So um, we use malt all over for its its inherent flavor, um, uh, which you know, without reactivating those enzymes, is delicious. We use it for its enzymatic power. So uh, malt has really been one of our kind of secret weapons over the past, you know, well, at least since I've been baking. Uh, I started from a brewing background, and so I brought malt with me. Uh, to baking, it is traditional to use for use in baking, but I, uh, I really think it's kind of underutilized, and I've I've been using it pretty, uh, uh, I don't want to say aggressively, but definitely I've been using it since then uh, to good purpose. For example, our, our seedy grains bread, which of course is uh, whole grain fresh milled, all that good stuff. Um, we actually use a, a porridge um, that is held at a specific temperature using malt to encourage the malt to generate as much um, uh, sugar and amino acid as possible from whole grains. So there's no, there's no actually, you know, external sugar sources in this, uh, but we generate a lot of sugar that, that um, uh, gives really nice crust coloration without drying out the, um, without drying out the bread. And so it's a, it's, it's a good flavor trick, but essentially malt is sprouted grain and it can be really um, certainly any cereal grain that's very traditional but it's all can be done with um, pseudo cereals and seeds uh, sprouted grain that is carefully dried um, 
to uh, retain the, the enzymatic properties that make it kind of a living thing. Question: uh, What type of salt does it matter? What salt you use for baking? So it doesn't matter the most. Um, whatever salt that you have in your pantry is most likely fine. We use a sea salt in the bakery, um, but pretty much any salt is is okay. Do you have feelings about either salt? Just use the salt that tastes the best for the buck. Best bang for your buck salt. That's always the solution. The iodized uh, component doesn't really change too much, um, but uh, it doesn't taste that great. So use a good tasting sea salt that's not crazy expensive. Or kosher salt. Kosher salt is also a good like pantry. Like that's something that I feel like most people have in their houses. Kosher is much better. Yes. So someone asked, can you use whole grains in pie crust? And then another question is, could you substitute whole wheat pastry flour for the flours in this recipe? Um, so you can use whole grain in pie crust. Um, my favorite flour to use is spelt. Um, it makes a really nice, tender, flaky crust. Um, but you can also use any wheat flour, any whole wheat flour. Um, I haven't found that I've needed to adjust my recipes too much for pie dough specifically, but um, whenever you're adding your water in on your, my cookie dough timer is going off. Um, whenever you add your water in at your last stage of making pie dough, if it comes together quicker than um, like before you add all of your water, then you can stop adding your water. But for the most part, you can sub whole grain flour and pie dough pretty easily. My highest recommendation is spelt flour though. Um, let me go get those from the oven. While Lex is getting the oven, I'm gonna eat a cookie. <laughs> Alex, uh, someone asked if you have a um, recommendation for egg replacer for this recipe. Now you're sound, gonna sound great, not only. <laughs> um, yeah, egg, egg replacer is tough. Um, I would recommend, uh, a lot of people recommend banana and that is, um, that serves for part of the component of the, the, uh, the egg if you're trying to replace it. But I always recommend for replacements uh, to look at the components of, of something and try and replicate those components. So in egg, you have an emulsifier um, uh, in the form of lecithin, which you can actually derive from the vegetable source in soy as well. Um, and uh, you also have fats, um, mixture of saturated and unsaturated, but it doesn't seem to matter that much. Um, coconut oil is a good replacement for a little bit of the fat. Uh, and um, and then you have, of course, protein and water being large components of that. So um, soy milk, I feel like a little bit of addition of soy milk um, along with uh, <clears throat> some extra fat is a good replacement for egg. I get real weird about that kind of stuff. And I try and recreate percentage wise, the percentage of uh, protein, <clears throat> starch, fiber, et cetera. And it, it you know, I, I we don't make a lot of, um, I would say, alternative uh, pastries uh, or, or breads in our case. So we do have some, some nice um, vegan breads and uh, we kind of started from a different perspective of, of instead of trying to replace the egg, uh, we really started um, trying to showcase the properties of something like our new uh, coconut pretzel shortbreads. Uh, we had this lovely local canola oil and we really also like coconut. And we started from that. So we didn't really consider egg in, as part of it. Uh, but my recommendation would be a combination of something that has a little protein plus um, a hefty amount of moisture because eggs are, um, you know, egg whites are like 90% water. And I don't remember offhand how, many, how much water yolks are, but the total is a, a very high proportion of water. So something like soy milk fits the bill pretty well there. It has emulsifiers, uh, it's a little wetter. So soy milk spiked with um, something high protein. 
which I honestly would recommend a, uh, a cooked a bean mash uh, would be a, a, a good replication. If you use banana, that's the common recommendation. Um, you end up uh, injecting moisture, which is good. And, and um, but apart from that, it doesn't share a lot in common with eggs. So it can behave quite differently. Wow, look at that. Look at that. A lot of people are asking the size of the scooper that you use, but I don't know if that matters, right? It's just gonna change the size of your cookie. Yeah, um, why don't we use coffee? Also, if you can add nuts, I would imagine yes, right? Definitely. So definitely nuts are um, delicious. So please, please add nuts. So why don't we use um, granola? Yeah, this recipe is a little bit smaller. Um, it's about, it says it's a size 30, um, but it's most likely like two to three tablespoons worth of cookie dough per But it, it honestly will not affect anything too dramatically. With, with cookies, you should always be baking to uh, your kind of desired crispiness, uh, regardless. So, uh, so, so the, the size of the scoop won't influence too much. These, again, these, are, these cookies are um, maybe a third the size of our normal cookies. Yeah, or, or thereabouts. Um, and the, <laughs> yeah, those are the normal ones. <laughs> and the, uh, the bake time does not differ too dramatically between those two sizes. So um, you make, make them whatever size you want. I tend to go on the bigger cookie size. Um, so I'm probably going to eat like six of these. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to show you guys the difference between a fresh cookie dough being baked and a um, cookie dough that was made about three days ago. Um, the ones that we did fresh are a little paler in color. They're a little flatter. Um, still going to be delicious, but I really like the aged um, cookie dough because it makes it a little bit chewier of a cookie. You get better color, um, better crispness on the edges. Um, so I wonder if I can hold them up. Yeah. So and can you um, go over the freezing? process again because a lot of people are asking the sound wasn't very good should they roll it first and then freeze and then can you bake them frozen or do yeah you know them? yeah absolutely um so i always recommend scooping the cookie dough first so that so if you think about freezing a hunk of dough and trying to scoop it and get a cookie later you're going to hurt your hand you're going to spur up your arthritis it's going to be terrible so um, always scoop your cookie dough or roll your cookie dough um, before you freeze it so that you don't have any work to do when you actually want a cookie. Um, and you can bake them from frozen. They won't spread out as much, but if your type of cookie is like a really thick, chewy, um, fudgy cookie, baking them from frozen is a really good way to achieve that texture. Um, also, if you want a thicker, chewier cookie, a higher temp for a longer, uh, shorter amount of time would do that as well. Um, what was the other question? I'm sorry. After you roll them, how do you freeze? Um, so at home, if I make cookie dough, I usually get a Tupperware, like if you have a square Tupperware container with like a decent amount of surface area, I usually scoop all of my cookie dough into that container. Um, if I have more than one layer, you can put a layer of parchment paper in between the two layers of cookies um, and then just pop a lid on and you're good to go. You can also, if you don't have Tupperware, you can put it on a baking pan and just wrap it in plastic wrap and freeze it that way as well. And then, and then you bake it frozen, right? You can bake it frozen um, if you want to. If you want a thick, chewy cookie, you can bake it straight from frozen. Or if you're impatient and you just want a cookie, definitely bake it from frozen, but you can thaw it out as well. We usually bake our cookies from refrigerated. So about, I think it's like 42 degrees is everyone's refrigerator runs about. Um, and that like will get us like a good spread on our cookie and still have some chewiness in the center. 
but really whatever temperature you find is like your best, um, like your favorite type of cookie, you can, you can really do whatever you want with cookies. Okay. Uh, someone asked uh, why Demerara sugar and what kind of chocolate chips are those? So Demerara sugar, we like to use so that we're not using processed refined sugar. Um, you can use white sugar if that's what you have in your pantry. Don't sweat it. Um, it'll still make a really nice cookie. We just try and use uh, the most natural ingredients and least um, processed ingredients possible. So that's why we like to use Demerara. We use Demerara in most of our um, baking products. Um, and I haven't found like I needed to adjust any quantities or anything. It's pretty much gram for gram, cup for cup um, with Demerara sugar. And then what was the other question? Oh, the chocolate chips. Um, we use a, it's the brand is Coco Berry. Um, they're 64% dark chocolate uh, pistols, they're called. Um, I don't know where you would be able to buy those, though. Here? Maybe, maybe we'll think about carrying them here, but I don't either. Um, you can get really nice, good bulk, uh, bittersweet chocolate that'll work just as well. And actually, that's that roughly 64% uh, bittersweet is, is a pretty common kind of level of, of uh, uh, cocoa fat. So you should be able to, you know, again, um, the, the characteristics of the chocolate are, uh, it's cocoa berry. If you're looking for that specific thing, you can buy their product online. Uh, but, um, any, any chocolate will work even white chocolate, if, if that's your thing, um, which it's not mine, <laughs> but I should add, um, yeah, Demerara is also, it's, it's easy to sub into a lot of recipes that use white flour because it doesn't contain any added moisture like 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 brown sugar. So brown sugar is literally white sugar with molasses added back in, um, but does impart a little additional moisture to the recipe, um, which sometimes can, can complicate things. Usually not, but sometimes it can. Um, so demerara sugar is just a, um, a less refined sugar that's been, uh, you know, fully dehydrated. Um, so it's, you know, it's like the, the not quite whole grain uh, version of sugar, but it's Polar. Um, so any tips for stopping cookies from spreading too much in the oven? Mine actually spread a lot too. What, is, what was the question? For spreading in the oven, any tips or just- um, could I, just would, stop it? I would refrigerate your dough for 20 minutes or you can freeze it. Um, the colder that your dough is, when it goes into the oven, the less it will spread. Yeah. Also, you can cream your butter and sugar a little bit less. Um, and that will prevent a little spreading as well. But if your dough is already made, definitely just refrigerate your cookie dough for like 15 to 20 minutes and it should spread less um, than room temperature is yeah. Or, or bake from, from frozen at that point, that will help as well. Can you use sprouted whole wheat flour in pastries? Sprouted whole wheat? Um, this is sprouted whole wheat flour. Uh, you can certainly use it in pastries. Um, the, the, the rules aren't nearly as clear cut. So sprouted whole wheat flour is actually, uh, let's say, usually it's like halfway to being malted whole wheat flour, as in like it's, um, it's sprouted, but typically it's sprouted a little less than, than is done for malting. Um, and uh, the same enzymes that are active that cause the, uh, the germination of the, the wheat kernel uh, and, and um, you know, are what we desire in, in a malt. Um, those enzymes actually contribute to the, the weakening of the structure of the, the grain itself. So um, yes, you can use sprouted flours absolutely in, in, uh, in pastries, in, in breads, et cetera, uh, but, but they can be tricky and there's not like, it's not a direct substitution necessarily uh, where, you know, like, all-purpose flour, you can sub out whole spelts very easily, uh, but you won't be able to sub out all-purpose flour for a sprouted whole wheat flour with the same kind of ease. Um, I should add that uh, one of the advantages of, you know, a sprouted flour is you've had some enzymatic breakdown of the, the, the grain itself. It renders it more flavorful, more digestible. So um, that is one of the reasons that we add malt to a lot of our recipes 
And actually one of the, um, of the side effects of aging your cookie dough in uh, the refrigerator, the freezer or whatever, um, is that those enzymes that are present in all flour, um, all grain, as long as it's not been um, heat processed, um, and the malt, of course, that's in the in the recipe, which is slightly active uh, enzymatically because it's actually a darker roasted malt. Um, those enzymes are active in that aging process, which is one of the reasons that an aged um, an aged cookie dough will produce a darker product. It's got a lot more free amino acids and a lot more um, of the specific size of sugar that contribute to browning. So um, if you are concerned about digestibility, then the standard practice of aging a cookie dough or long fermenting a bread dough will achieve similar things as um, using a sprouted flour, but maybe with more, a slightly more predictable performance. All right. Um, I think we're getting, I, I think we're supposed to end at 6.30. I don't have the schedule with me, but does anybody know? <laughs> um, in the meantime, I will, Okay, lots of questions about the dough. Oh, people, someone asked if you're gonna, if you plan to start the grain share again, and also ask about where to get flowers and which you have at the bakery, but maybe you wanna recommend another um, place um, for flowers that you might not have there. Yeah, uh, so I know there, there's a lot more activity at local farmers markets right now. Um, you can get, for example, at Head House Farmers Market, um, <clears throat> Morganics uh, is a is a frequent uh, attendee of the Head House Farmers Market on, on Sundays. Um, and and uh, uh, Scott has uh, delicious and wonderful uh, oat products that they grow on their farm organically, um, and, and he also mills um, some some different wheat flowers as well. So that's one option. Um, Currently, we're the only place that sells our um, uh, milled flowers, and I, I really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to, to be boastful when I say that our, our um, besides the spelt flour, which is pretty universally great because of the softness of the grain, um, our, our other flowers are really, really fine-tuned and excellent. So we sell a, an all-purpose whole wheat flour and lightly sifted flours. Um, that are that are really good for all purpose applications. Um, uh, there's also Small Valley Milling, which again, there you'll you'll learn about them in the in the segment. Uh, but amazing, amazing place. There are close partners. We love them. Such good product, and we get most of our grain from them. You can buy their products now more places, including uh, again, as I mentioned, River Rewards Produce in in Fishtown, which I know they're actually I think in the works opening more locations of River Rewards. That's what I've heard. Uh, but River Wards is a wonderful grocery store that uh, has really been a um, strong supporter of local artisans and has, um, in, in many cases, provided, you know, kind of the much needed support to help us all to grow. So I would definitely recommend if you can going there. Um, I can't recommend too many other sources, uh, Whole Foods, for example. Um, they, they do have some local grain products, but I can't speak for their, their freshness. Um, and they have a lot of, of things that are kind of whole grains, which means they've been um, actually processed to, to stabilize them for shelf stability. So they're not truly whole grains. So uh, I, I would recommend really, um, you know, the, the, your local farmer's market may have a local grain vendor, depending on where you live. There are some in New Jersey. There's actually a grain collective in New Jersey. Um, you could buy direct from the vendor. Castle Valley has really dialed in their, their Castle Valley milling. They've really dialed in their shipping and online store during the pandemic. River Wards Produce in Fishtown, a great place to buy this stuff locally. You can get all of our flowers here at our cafe. We also take them to our farmer's markets. Uh, I offered email in, um, in Collingswood, New Jersey. There's a store called Haddon Culinary. I've seen some uh, local flower on their shelves as well. Um, that's whole great. So not a huge selection, but still like something to get your feet wet in. And they also carry uh, our breads and the breads of uh, Merspacher's Bakery, who are our dear friends and make delicious bread as well. That's great. Alex, do you want to remind of where you're located right now? Yeah, so we're at uh, 2218 Walnut Street. And um, I should add that uh, we're going to make an effort to probably starting this weekend to carry our, the, the malted flowers um, that we've used in this recipe. We haven't carried them on the regular. Uh, 
uh, but we will uh, make an effort to have them starting this weekend on the regular. You can also buy those directly from Deer Creek Malt House. So yeah, we're at uh, 2218 Walnut. It's right between 23rd and 22nd. Uh, we'll be open seven to three Monday through Friday and eight to three Saturday through Sunday. And then um, at some point in the pretty soon future, we'll be adding nighttime hours for uh, whole grain pizza, which is um, going to be really vegetable focused and delicious. That's awesome. Well, I just want to thank you guys again. Uh, this was great. And I want to thank everybody for the Q&A and who signed up. We had a great turnout and that's very exciting. Uh, I want to remind everybody of the Grain Chain that airs tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. on WHYY TV. Uh, please go to our website, www.whyy.org slash movers and makers. Follow us on Instagram, movers and makers WHYY for more content. I will link some of those answers like connections to where to find flour and other questions that we didn't have time to answer. And I think we'll see you all tomorrow on the show. <laughs> I'm excited. Thanks so much, Monica. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Have a good night.